This is the best or worst podcast. And now, here are your hosts, Koji Steven Sakai and M. Martin Mapoma. All righty. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Koji. And this is Martin. And this is the best or worst podcast. We are excited to be here. Uh, this is episode number 91. Very excited. We're, we're almost at 100, which is crazy. Um, so let me, yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. Our, society, our society is so focused on celebrity. We sometimes forget that regular people lead interesting lives too. Best or worst moment of your life hosts Koji Stevens, the guy, that's me. And M. Martin Mapoma, which is? That is definitely me. You are here to, uh, to let out your story. We put people on the spot. What are they going to hear? It could be funny. It could be poignant. It could be sad. You'll know when we know. Best or Worst is a twice-weekly podcast. On Tuesdays, which is today, we get to know our guests. And on Thursdays, which is two days from now, we will find out their best or worst moment. And today we have a special guest. And Martin, he's your, he's your guest. Why don't you introduce him? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've known Ed for a long time, inadvertently and directly. Um, Ed Donnelly, this guy is an amazing producer, amazing musician. Uh, I met Ed Ed through, actually believe it or not, through my brother Chando, who's uh, back in Africa. And then, you know, I lost track of Ed for a while and then started uh, training his awesome son, who is probably one of the meanest boxers I know out there at his age. <laughs> and uh, yeah, dude, he can, he can throw. But um, through music, really, um, Ed gave me uh, a, a really cool zip drive with some uh, Cohen Cambria on it. Am I, am I allowed to say that, Ed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was... I mean, no, wait, wait, wait. Crazy. No, no. Actually, you purchased... That's what I, that's what I, that's what I said. <laughs> I purchased some, <laughs> some Cohen and Cambria from you. That was really great. But anyway, no, but Ed's always, you know, he's one of the people that I really admire. Um you know he's the, he's the unofficial mayor of South Pasadena. <laughs> oh no no no! I'm the meter. I'm the unofficial meter maid of South Pasadena. No no no! Oh, no. More than that, oh, but no. don't hey, don't park in front of my house. Yeah, Wait, we're, oh, oh, I don't. But no, Ed's had, Ed had a long and you know illustrious career as, as a musician and a producer, and so I just thought it'd be only only right to have him on the show because he's one of the guys I really look up to. And I just want to say I apologize for where I am right now. There's there's no excuse for it, but here here I am doing what we got to do. So, um, Ed Donnelly, welcome to the show. And Thanks, well, guys. Thanks for having me. Why don't you tell me, how did you get started in music? Is this something you always wanted to do? Yeah, I was kind of, um, the, the origin story, if you will, is when I was a very, very young toddler, um, we lived outside of Philadelphia, and there was a Yamaha organ store at the mall. And there was always a guy out in front with playing some bossa nova stuff on the yamaha organ and i would stop and dance in front of the store until my mom forced like dragged me away crying and i for whatever reason that will kind of you know at two three four years old whatever it was the music was calling to me then even though it was this crazy you know home organ bossa nova music and um and, and i always i always go back to that because i i you know, I wasn't aware, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't thinking, oh, that's cool. It was just a reaction that I had. So I think, okay, somehow I was born into this world and the music was going to call to me somehow. And it started then. Um, and then for, you know, 40, 50 years later to end up as an organist in a band is kind of uh, maybe full circle. Okay, so um, do you play the organ? Do you play any other instruments or? Well, I... I you know, I, um, I'm, I'm going to put some shameless plugs in. Uh, sure. A few years ago, I, I um, began playing this band called Little Silver Hearts from South Pasadena, California. And um, Sean Lowenthal's the singer and kind of the, the you know, heart and soul of the band. And we did a record together. And I produced the record. And at the time, it was just kind of me and him um, working. And he would come in with ideas. And I would flesh them out playing other instruments. And then we wanted to go do some shows and he had a great, I found him a great bass player, found him a great guitarist, found him a great pedal steel player, found him a great drummer. And so there was nothing for me to do. <laughs> so I said, well, I'll play keyboards, which was unusual because I didn't play keyboards four years ago. Yeah. 
so I, I did a crash course and kind of sat in, in the house and, and shedded for a month and a half. And my wife was going crazy because she was so tired of hearing like Doors records as <laughs> me trying to play along. Um, and so I started playing organ then and, 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 and a little bit of piano too. But, um, but I, I, as a kid, I was a trumpet player, you know, fifth grade band. Um, and through high school, I picked up guitar and that was kind of my main instrument for a while. But when I was in my 20s, I started doing um, music for TV commercials. And I, I did a TV commercial for, I think it was, it was, it was the Miami Herald. I've, and, um, you know, I sent in the invoice and the producer of the spot came back and said like, hey, do you have an invoice for the talent? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, the players who played on this. And I said, oh, do I, I have to invoice you separately for that? And he said, well, just include it next time. So in the back of my mind, I'm going like, well, wait a minute. I was the guitar player. I was the drummer and I was the bass player. <laughs> and I get to invoice you for those three things on top of me doing this. So I started, um, so I, at that point I was like, okay, I need to learn how to play a bunch of stuff so that I, just so I can kind of fudge these invoices. And if this is illegal, I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations is run on it. <laughs> Well, you did play um, the instrument. It's not like you didn't play it, though. Right, right, right. But <laughs> but then I, you know, you know, I, yeah, you know. But I, you know, there was always a name for the guy, you know, like you yeah. know, Har Harry Georgeson played guitar. You know? <laughs> so, 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 Ed, how old are you at this point? I'm 52, and it. No. What? Oh, when I was doing that stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh, I was in my early. I was 20, like 23 to 27. I was doing a lot of TV commercials. Well, and by that time, how many instruments could you play? Um, so th the inspiration for that was I could play, like I said, I could kind of like, I was a guitar player predominantly, yeah. but started noodling on these other things because I had to. Um, and then because I found it could be lucrative. And the inspiration was um, I went to the Musicians Institute in Hollywood. That's kind of how I ended up in LA from the East Coast and the Midwest. And I took master classes with a guy named Tommy Tedesco. And Tommy Tedesco was a studio guitarist in the 60s. He was part of the infamous wrecking crew of studio musicians. And you, you know, it, you name a, a pop song from the 60s, he's probably playing on it. Any like Sonny and Cher or the Grassroots or uh, Mamas and the Papas. Just I all know that name. Yeah, and his son, um, Denny, in the last few years produced a film called The Wrecking Crew about his dad and that like extraordinary group of a couple dozen musicians. Sure. Um, and so I went to a master class with him one time and he had all of these instruments on stage. Banjos and mandolins and ouds and like anything that had strings on it. And he said, you know, as a young player, he, he was a great guitar jazz guy, could play guitar, but there was a lot of great jazz guys who he was competing with to get studio work. And he somehow stumbled onto the idea that he would be the guy who plays everything, but he would take these instruments and instead of learning to actually play, say the mandolin, he would just tune it like a guitar or a banjo, he would tune it like a guitar. And oh, wow. so so they got a call like, hey, we need a mandolin player. I can, I can do it. To the point where in the 70s, there was a mini series called Shogun starring Richard Chamberlain. Oh, yeah. And the soundtrack called for a Kyoto, which is a Japanese instrument. And he played all the parts on a banjo. <laughs> wow. Right, Boy. imitating a Kyoto. And, and that, was the, it, it, that was absolutely the inspiration for me to go like, Okay, if this dude can fake it, I can fake it, right? Like, but make it credible. Yeah. But make it credible. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it has to sound authentic to what the instrument's supposed to sound like. And so that was that. That was the beginning of this um, collection of instruments that I have now that I do play sometimes now authentically. But if not, I found ways to make them work in context of a recording that sounds like what a player who was a master of that instrument would play in a simple context. Wow. And, do uh, you, um, how many instruments do you, uh, so you, how many instruments do you have, first of all? I'm not sure. Wow. Um, 
does I, I let me put it this way i've got at least 20 guitars um i've got a whole bunch of vintage synthesizers i've got as many harmonicas as i do guitars uh, i've got a handful of banjos you know there, there's a lot of stuff and and yeah theremin um it, and it kind of the the collection sort of is it comes together as needed like I'm working on something, I'm like, oh, we need that thing. So I yeah. go and get it. But I learned early on, never sell. Because later, you know, 10 years later, you'll be like, oh, we yeah. need that thing. And I sold it. <laughs> so now I just kind of like hold on to them, even if they're kind of around and taking up space, there will be a time and a place for them to come back into play. What, wow. what, do, what do people have uh, or what do people get wrong about your career that they always get wrong about? Is there something that people always assume about your career like like for example for me as a writer I'm a screenwriter people always assume that when I'm home I have nothing, I'm not doing work because I'm home so like my mom always used to like make me go to the market and be like Can you go to the market I'm like I'm working and she's like you're home <laughs> so what it, like is there, is there something like um something that people get wrong about your career that, that people that people wouldn't know yeah I mean it, it's a similar thing in that um I kind of work all day, every day, except for when I'm asleep. And the it's not necessarily a, um, even for, for creative people that I know, and maybe when you're screenwriting, you could, you know, relate to it is, I don't schedule time for things. Um, and, and not because I'm irresponsible with time, but just because as, as things arise, I'm able to sort of address what needs to be done or let inspiration seep in and make space for it. Yeah. And so it may look like I'm not doing anything, um, but really, you know, there's a lot going on sort of behind the scenes, either in preparation for something that I'm working on or just in preparation itself to be ready to, you know, and, and, and I'm not a, like a great writer or a great visionary, but just to be able to be ready. So, you know, when the moment strikes that, okay, I've, I've, Spent, as an example, great, great example. Um, since last July, I've spent about five or six hours a week locked up in the back room, practicing very intensely to learn how to play pedal steel guitar. It's an immensely difficult instrument. And it's been one of the toughest challenges because like I said, with a lot of this stuff, I was able to kind of fake my way through it there's no faking with pedal steel guitar. Like it is what it is. You can't sort of make it work the way you want it to. It's like driving a 57 Oldsmobile and playing guitar at the same time. Wow, okay. <laughs> so, so what happens is, is that next year I'll play on a track and people will be like, oh, he plays pedal steel guitar. I didn't know that. But in the meantime, you know, I've been trying to, you know, find, all, all the time I can to go out there and just sit and play scales and play chords and really learn the techniques and listen to the, the classic records and learn how to emulate them. So it's that, it's that, it's all that like prep work that nobody sees that when you actually do something, they're like, oh, well, that's fairly accomplished. I didn't know I could do that. But nonetheless, you were just at home. Yeah, maybe exactly. you know, sitting around doing nothing. That's funny because uh, I have a similar story always about writing. So when I, I used to when I used to date, I'm married now. But when I date, I'd I'd take a woman to you know the premiere of my movie or something, and then they'd ask me what I'm doing the next night. And I'm like, I'm writing. You know, what are you doing the next time? I'm writing. <laughs> what do you doing? What do you want to talk about the next day? I'm my writing. And so like they didn't understand that you know in order for me to have a premiere, I need to work. I need to write, and it doesn't involve you being around. You know, like it doesn't involve you being around. You because you just don't see that part of like the creative process, the writing, the working, the getting, the getting like your craft. And they just, a lot of people just see you on stage and be like, oh yeah, he's just immensely talented, but they don't realize that all the work that you put in, not just actually working, but thinking about it, getting prepared, learning things. Re reading right? about it, listening yeah. to yeah. things, you know, I, it, it, it's an education that uh, you don't get in class. Yeah. If you, if you are driven to do great stuff, you're going to be a, pretty obsessive about it. 
um, all day, every day. And, you know, and, and those obsessions might change, you know, depending on what it is you're trying to learn. But your mind is occupied with those things in a way that um, people who are not necessarily as creative might not understand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have one of the things I, when I teach, I just got out of a, 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 a retreat, a writer's retreat. One of the things I have is a list of questions and like, the questions are, would you, you know, would your life be terrible if you did it, if you weren't a screenwriter, you know, do you, would you write, would you write movies even if you never got paid for it? You know, like yeah. all these things and all the questions were like, if you said no to any of them, I'm like, this is not your career. You know, like, yeah. okay. you, know it's, it, you know, it's funny. It's tough because, you know, as an artist, that's what we go through our whole lives, you know, unless you're fa unless you're a famous you know, musician or a famous actor or even a famous writer, you know, people just assume that you have a, you know, your, your day job is your main job you know right they don't understand they don't understand that you know that you know if you're truly passionate about it like you just said you it's something you do 24 7 you know i know koji writes more than anybody i know it's crazy he's always writing you know yeah so i work with a lot of at this point in my career I've, I've become really interested in working with a lot of young artists who are just starting their careers yeah and 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 part of its age and i kind of want to pass down some tribal wisdom and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and but, but it's also really intriguing to me that they're so hungry. Um, yeah. But, but one thing that comes up from time to time is like, oh, you made this record. Well, what are you going to shop it to a label? Or are you going to do, do, try to find a deal? And I'm like, you know what? These guys are artists and they're going to put this shit out. In, oh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say. That's fine. Yeah, you are. Okay. You are. Right. They're going to put this shit out into the world no matter what. They don't yeah. need to, they want to get paid. They don't need to get paid. Yeah. They're going to do it, and the world is going to have it thrown out to them no matter what. And that's the artistic imperative. Artists make art, and that's part of that obsessive, driven thing that people may not understand. Yeah, it's true. It's very true. You know, I think, you know, it's funny. I was ta I talked to uh, Michael Madsen once at, an art, at a, at a, at a um, movie festival. And, you know, I asked, I asked him about, you know, his career. And one of the things he said was that he didn't think that he could make it now like he did back then because of how hungry these young kids are, you know? Uh, you know, as, as you, you know like, you, like you just said, you don't need a big record, record label to put out your music. The same thing as, be, you know, with being an actor. You know, you, if you have an iPhone with a really good camera, you can make a movie that could, that could be a huge hit. Yeah, it, but hit or not, you make your art. Exactly. That's really important. Really important. And and if you are and, and, and Koji, to your point, if you're saying no to things like uh, I I not sure if I have time for this because of my life, well then you're probably not in the right spot because you yeah. will make time. Yeah, stop exactly. sleeping. Yeah. Just stop sleeping. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, when I had, when I had a day job, I woke up at three o'clock every day to write and I stopped my day job. Go. I stopped my day job to realize when I realized that my 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. job was making more money than my 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. job. <laughs> and I'm that's like, it. Why, why am I waking up at three o'clock to do this? That's job, it. Right? No, no, but that's it. But, but a lot, you see it in the faces when you talk to people about that and you say like, you need to get up at 3 a.m. and work on this, or you need to stay up an extra hour later. And yeah. they're like, oh, I can't do that. Well, yeah. Then you, then you can't answer that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell me, um, well, one, time for one more question. Why don't you tell me, are there any instruments that you want to learn how to play that you haven't learned already? Or have you learned pretty much everything you wanted to learn? Um, I, I studied cello for a little bit. I was terrible at it. And it, at some point, I probably should to pick that up. So like other guys will retire and maybe take up golf. I might take up cello. <laughs> <laughs> you might take up cello? That's great. Yeah. That's I great. mean, it, well, it's easier on your knees, you know, like it, it'll be all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ed, for coming on. Really appreciate it. It was great getting to know you and getting to know your career. Um, thank yeah. you so much, everyone, for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we will see you in two days wearing the same clothes. And I'll be wearing the same clothes. And Mario will be wearing the same clothes. And in two days, will still be driving around. Mario will still be That's driving it. around. No. Uh, and, in two, yeah. and in two days, we will ask you your uh, best or worst moments. So thank you guys. And thank you, everybody.